Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. And I'm Kevin Graham. And I am delighted to say that today we are joined by average Joe Miller of Not The View fame. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I've been wanting to speak to you on this podcast for a long time because I was an avid reader of Not The View back in the day. I'm still a avid reader. Kevin still is an avid reader. It was groundbreaking. It really was groundbreaking. Take us back to those days, Joe. What made you get involved in, in this thing that at that time was a burgeoning scene? It's, well, basically what happened is just strolling up the gallery, it's a chain kind of thing. <laughs> it's, it's all is, and going to Celtic Park and I seen this, this uh, magazine. I wasn't involved in the first two issues. I seen this fanzine and I went, picked it up, what's this? Got in touch with them straight away. I went, this is my mind in here, you know, and then... Turns out we're drinking a horseshoe together. Metal Jerry Dunbar's a guy, he's a genius behind it, and George Shanks, they, they were the two guys. George of the Jungle, as he's known as. <laughs> and uh, I got in tow with these guys right away, and we just hit it off. And we were going through dire times at Celtic, as you know, and the fanzine scene was like private eye, punk scene, we all had the same kind of background, and kind of maybe not so much George, but Jerry and I, and punk music and stuff like that. So fanzines like sniffing glue and, and this was all our kind of inspiration and we just thought something had to be done here like-minded people got a few other guys got in tow as well and we just thought we need to do something this is our club we need to try and get other people on board and that was the forum to do it mm-hmm. was selling fanzines and putting it out there so that was the basic background to it you know it came off the back of last game of the season we were one nothing St Johnson beat us the last game of the season you're trudging back down to the pubs and going, where are we going? You know, and it was it was dire times, you know. You look at the time when you're living through it, you don't actually think how how close we were to all these mm-hmm. things, you know, and how how or where it was going to go. But you knew you had to do something. That was basically it. And this was the roots. This was the roots of what came after. What what eventually happened in ninety four was you were able to get a group of people together, a small group of people, and then you're spreading the word to a larger group. And there was a fan movement. What interests me, reading back the, the first few editions, was you were before your time in terms of your, your thought process. You were talking about this club needs to go public. A lot of, a lot of guys who were going to games weren't thinking like that, Joe, but when you look at it now, you think, wow, they were telling us what we should have been doing seven years before it happened. Yeah, certainly, but the, the, there also was a hardcore against us you know and, uh, mm-hmm. guys we all took turns and there was loads of sellers we were trying to put it out to everybody and some of the, some of the push they were getting was unbelievable you know and and as as, as well and you look at the Celtic view and they were putting out letters and you're doing a grand job boys and, and up the Celts and you're just going well there was a bit of friction as well but I think the majority of people knew that something had to change and yet being part of the club, the totals were always part of the club, but we were only part of the club standing in the terrace and paying more money. Mm-hmm. It wasn't anything involved in being part of a sharehold or whatever. So, and a family destiny is is what we had, and we knew that had to change as well. You know, mm. um, they didn't see it coming. They they would have ran us right into the the ground and still wouldn't have seen or done anything to change it. What yeah. was the uh editorial meetings, if you said editorial meetings in the horseshoe bar, what were they like when you were planning the, the, the issues? The, the early days was uh, was basically just like any other punters, you guys, you'd go with your mates, you'd go back to the pub, you'd talk about the game, you'd talk about maybe the upcoming game, you'd talk about everything else round about it, just life in general and a couple of wee laughs and laughing about the, the Huns and all that and everything that was going on, any other team that we were up against. That, that was... When we we just done it like that, that's basically how it was done. And we go away, and then the next issue, but with all these thoughts and all the rest. And then <laughs> Jerry and I tried to kind of break it down a wee bit, and the two of us got together and tried to do like Tuesday night meetings. <laughs> uh, and we used to always meet in the pubs in the town, and we used to get slaughtered. And the following day, we'd actually phone each other and go, what did we talk about last night? <laughs> what did we decide What did we on? agree? We were going, I, I, I had a bag full of stuff and I'm going, I don't know, what I'm, I was met today with this, Jerry, and he's going, I can't remember either. <laughs> so we had to cut out meetings in pubs. <laughs> Gently had to stop it. It was just getting ridiculous. So that kind of side is, is the humour side as well is which we always kept in the fanzine and 
uh, we always kept it looking like a fanzine as well. Mm-hmm. We, we had the colour later on, but we always kind of, that's the way we wanted it. We wanted to be street, we wanted to be fans, and we wanted that kind of dirty kind of look about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a but, fans but you still got yeah. mm-hmm. there's some of them are now glossy and upmarket whereas yeah. not the view still looks like the ones I used to buy yeah I think and, if we uh, changed I think a lot of people would have maybe not have come down on us a bit but new fans in starting I'm fine with that that's mm-hmm. the way because they're just coming in that's the way they are but if not the view was to change into like a programme that's what we were always trying to avoid we weren't a programme we weren't the Celtic view we were not so uh-huh. uh, we always try to keep it that kind of street kind of thing, and so I, what a normal guy in the boozer would read it and go, "Aye, that's kind of me," you know. Mm-hmm. So when I think about when I think back, there was brilliant self-deprecating humour, right? And obviously we were always poking fun at the Huns. There was actually a cartoon called The Huns, remember, mm-hmm. with the Terry Hurlock uh, hair and all that. Terry and, Fuckwit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean. Terribly contrived photos of the stars, kind of thing. Um, great Celtic haircuts of our time. Uh, Who was coming up with this, Joe? Oh, Dunbar, Dunbar's a genius, man. He's an absolute <laughs> genius. Uh, but again, that's the stuff that's just talked about over the bar in the pub, you know. And you'll probably date you yourselves when you go back to, after a game and somebody will crack a joke uh, about I, something. A weird goat like Andy Murdoch, who joined us as well. He remembers everything. Now, Jerry and myself, and all that, we're, we're forgetful. You know, we really are forgetful with things. But Andy's a pure, he's a stato, he remembers everything you say. And we'll turn around and say, I remember that issue. And Andy will go, No, that was that one. You know, and we'll, right, okay. And uh, so he remembers all this stuff as well. And so if we cracked a joke about, uh, he was embarrassing the hoops today. Now, some, that's how that came about. Who embarrassed the hoops? Uh, you know, and then all that came in. So, he's got a lot of stick. For that call, eh? Of course we did, did I? But aye. then I also saw it as tongue-in-cheek. I totally was tongue-in-cheek. I didn't take it serious, aye. it was always There a... was one, uh, Wally Gardner, and uh, somebody wrote in and says, or, or somebody wrote a letter saying, I, I'm related to him or something like that. Wait a minute, it was just a laugh. He's got two own goals in his first game, he's going to get stuck. <laughs> and you know, you're just going, well, come on, it's a bit of tongue-in-cheek. You know, we, we supported the guys when they played, even though they were crap. Mm-hmm. You know, or just... Frank Monroe and all that, you know. Aye. I remember him coming in, captain, and Jock made him captain. You think, if you will, so this guy's quite interesting. Buying OGs as well, and you're going, this guy's a dud. So he was obviously going to get put in it as well. But now, it's like present players are new, you'd think, are they up to it? If we had an embarrassed the hoots, we could do it. But people would go absolutely mental uh-huh. with if we'd done it the new. I'd, I'd still go out and support it. Everybody's got players they like and dislike mm-hmm. as well, who mm-hmm. they rate. But see, once they play, I support them. Mm-hmm. Even the ones I don't like, I don't, don't rate. Uh, there's a lot of people who can't see the difference. You know? Everything's black and white, but oh, I think that's aye. a lot today with social media now. Aye. Um, you know, just do a special for Marvin Compere, because I actually played more minutes than he did at Celtic Park last season. You've got to do just a special, you embarrassed. He's to see when he was going around with the trophy. And all oh, that. Oh, you're John Terry. Eh? I thought... <laughs> Not a brass neck given, man. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. When we were at the, the cup final last, uh, last season, the one against Motherwell, mm-hmm. he was in the, the lounge right. that we were in. Aye. And I'm going, I need to go and get a picture took with him. I Aye. need to go up to him and go, Marvin, can I get a picture with you? I never had the, the guts to do it. But again, when you talk about modern day stuff, that's, that's just modern day football players. Is, don't, don't give a job. There, no. there's, there's hundreds of Marvin Compers in the oh, country. All over. Aye. Aye. And, and you need to take, you need to kind of. Look at his side of it. He's getting decent money. Mm-hmm. Probably loving life the way he likes it. He's just enjoying it. Personally, you go like that. I'd rather play football any day of the week, you know. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. he's got a lot of football players are happy just taking a wage and not bothering their, their ass about having to go out and play football. I remember talking to a, an ex Celtic captain and really being taken aback when he told us it's a job. And I'm going, What do you mean it's a job? Aye. He went, It's a job. He says, It's been my job since I've been 16. Aye. He says, I really don't have any emotional attachment to playing football. Yeah. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. I didn't see it like that. Well, no. our, our kind of era growing up was, if you're a football player, have a job behind you. Mm-hmm. you know, Jim Craig, a dentist and all that. And you look maybe at the rest of the, the good lines, for example. Mm-hmm. It's pub trade and all that. They yeah. maybe buy a pub or something. That was that was all they could get out of it, you know, in, in a way. But modern day players now and... Do they need anything outside it? No, the money they get, if they're careful enough, they don't need to do anything, you mm-hmm. know. And 
the money's the money is quite obscene to be honest, yeah, you know, it is obscene, definitely. you know. It's um, the whole football modern football is quite obscene to mm. be honest. Mm. Even the money young laddies get now at sixteen uh, when they're in the academy system. Uh, more down in England than, than up in here, yeah, eh? uh, If they're if they're tossed out of the game by uh, the time they're twenty one. They, they, they they've got money. Uh, and you it's it's no wonder these you hear all these uh, tales of young laddies, young guys getting lost as mm. soon as they leave football. And, and yeah, and they, they lose themselves out the game because of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they get it too early and all. And we all know guys that oh he could have been a player and all that. Or some players, young players lose it through injury or whatever, or just maybe no breakthrough or whatever. But there's players just losing it because they had money too early, and mm-hmm. that's, that's quite sad. Yeah, the hunger, uh, the hunger ah, goes, doesn't it? You know, the young boy been down to for us, for us, I, I, mm-hmm. still, we were talking about him the other week as well. And where is he now? Can he get a game with Hibs? Can he get a club? Well, see, he... see the thing as well, Joe. When, when we talk about not the view, the impact of that um, and then we, we talk about it in terms of the, the various fan movements that, that came thereafter we were talking to Jim Moore last year uh, a fair bit and when you read back the, the Save Our Celts stuff you know not that you covered it extensively mm. he even printed his final letter when they decided to you know disband the group and all this kind of mm-hmm. thing um, there, there's high, highlights and, and low points one of the things I always remember is the Jocks team bust what can you remember about that? I mean, that, that that was actually really difficult for you to get any Celtic part with that, wasn't it? Well, they refused. Totally refused. Uh, yeah, we got involved with uh, Save Our Celts and all that, and then Celts for Change. Now, we didn't... We always we always publicised it, and now the, when they made a committee and all the rest, we were always at the meetings and supporting them and all that, but we, th- we thought, that that's their legs, let them mm-hmm. do it. That has to go that way, so we, we supported it all the way. But the likes of the bust, um, Celtic, it's, it's an absolute cracker. Every time I see it, still, I my heart flutters, man, you know, and uh, Celtic didn't want it. Uh, we were the malcontents, you know, and uh, didn't want it, so... Such a great name, that. Uh, and, uh, Is there a band called that yet? Should be. Should be, aye. <laughs> and we put it in the People's Palace, and Sean Fallon came along and unveiled it, and it was, it was a great day, and... We thought, ah, that's that's fitting. People's Palace for Jockstein. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Used to always take my nephews and all that was born up at People's Palace and go, there's Jockstein's now bust and all that. And then when it finally went into Celtic Park, when Fergus came back, uh, they asked, asked us up and they'd done a presentation and we put George of the Jungle out in the middle <laughs> of the park and <laughs> Jerry and I were up in one of these boxes pissing ourselves <laughs> laughing, drinking away. <laughs> George was out there with his bonnet. And uh, uh, that was that was just brilliant to see it coming home, you know, where it should be. And it is pride of place when you walk into Celtic Park, it's there. We're actually uh, just getting involved uh, just now to uh, change the wee plaque on it because it was done, the plaque was put on very hastily. It just it doesn't really say much on it. But so uh, I've been in touch with... Celtic, so we can get it back in a proper plaque saying, because it doesn't even say not the view on it. I know it was fans that done it, you know, mm-hmm. but it was not mm-hmm. the view subscriptions that actually paid for it. Mm-hmm. So, and that's where all our money went. People used to always say, you must be loaded, but the money all went straight back into a bar towel. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they choose the night meetings. <laughs> <laughs> it was all done, you know, things like that, that bust, you know, it's, it's God, when we're gone, and hopefully that's still at Celtic Park. We're going to change the plaque so it represents a wee bit more of it, not mm-hmm. if you've done mm-hmm. and the subscribers to uh, get a wee bit of recognition. So. Not the view, they were also, he's weren't he scared to tackle some social issues as well, uh, especially racism. Um, one incident when Mark Walters signed for Rangers and the Celtic support, some, some factions of the Celtic support didn't uh, give him what we would call a uh, Celtic welcome. Was that an easy issue? To tackle, it was in a way, because but um, there's loads of political issues we could talk about now in a, in our kind of group, as you call it. We don't we don't actually have a group as in, but there is a hardcore of us. Now we all have different different political beliefs, and we all believe in different ways of supporting Celtic. Now, I'm personally I'm right into the political side of it all, and I enjoy all that and. Some of the guys just want to go and see Celtic, and I get that, you know, mm-hmm. and they get me as well. And we, we have like, still have discussions about it. The, the thing that there was fanzines already t- 
talking about the, the political side in Ireland with Chuck, Chucky Allard and all the rest of it. And I used to read that and, and they had their audience for that, mm-hmm. but Not The View was more about the football, a bit of fun, slagging the SFA, the referees, Masonic conspiracy, you know, mm-hmm. you know what we were. And um, when the, the racism thing came about, we did. We just we didn't even really discuss it. We just done it, you know. We thought, aye, well, it's our fans doing it, you know. Mm. This is something we will talk about, you know. We've had uh, accusations before saying, well, why are you bringing that subject up but not that one, you know. And but as I said, there was other fanzines covering the mm. Irish question and yeah. everything about it. So why would we get involved and try and do something else that it was already been done? Mm-hmm. And we thought, well, these guys are doing it, they're doing it the way they want to do it. I, I remember reading the issue when, when you brought it up. And for a younger guy, I, I, I would have been about 12, 13 at the time, who never really experienced any racist behaviour. But to see it and go, I think that's wrong. But then you've got older guys who you did go to the football with who were brung up in the 60s and the 70s making monkey noise and that on the supporters bus, going to the game. Mm-hmm. And you, I'm reading not the view going, no, I agree with these guys. This is no, uh-huh. this is no right. And I think there was an influence of the younger generation with buying your fans in to bring those issues and especially Mark Walters issue. Yeah, anyway. definitely. It's, uh, it had to be. It had to be addressed. It's like um, I see now. We go to see Celtic for the football. No, that's definitely. that's the main thing. But there is a certain education you can get going to football. Definitely. You know? And um, I see it through the Green Brigade just now, mm-hmm. and, and whether you like or dislike. But look at the Palestinian thing. Mm-hmm. You know that went worldwide. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I can touch on that later when I went over to. Uh, see Celtic playing the Champions League over there, but it is a kind of education for you going to a football match. It used to be like, like I got it when I was younger in the seventies, and I got it going on the, the supporters yeah, bus, and the supporters was, bus, and, uh, and I remember even as well songs getting sung. Now we need to talk about things like this. Was I'd rather be a darky than a hun? Mm-hmm. Used to be a song, well sung, and nobody ever questioned it back then. And yeah, it was a kind of cultural thing, but but it also said what it said, mm-hmm. you know, and and. Uh, there was even other ones that I would rather wear a turban than a sash. So we can't hide away from these no, things, you know, and we, we, we should talk about them, mm-hmm. you know, because it's mm-hmm. the only way to go over them. Mm-hmm. And funny enough, when you talk about racism, uh, just at the... I was talking to somebody on Twitter, and uh, he reminded me how I pulled somebody up about racism at Dens Park, and I said, well... And it was about 15 years ago, and I, I said, well, funny enough, I've just done it recently at Aberdeen when we won the league, clinched the league, a guy shouted something, and I, I was actually myself at the game, you know, I've got pals, but I was myself <laughs> at the game, my mate couldn't come up, who travels to the away games with us, so I just drove up myself, and this guy shouted something, and I immediately, without thinking, pulled him up, and luckily enough, troops around about me, all mm-hmm. done the same, the guy bolted double quick time, but mm-hmm. I'm just like, I'll still go at it, you know, and it'll never go away, because we... Everybody thinks a typical Celtic fan is that, but we're goat racist. We're, we're, you know. we're, we're, a, we're a broad church. Aye, of course, and we're, we're goat racist and we're support. We have. You mm-hmm. know, and we can't let them be the voice. If they want to come along, fine, but this is this is what it is and isn't it acceptable. Who makes the rules, I don't know, but uh, I know certainly what I think is acceptable and not acceptable, and yes. I'm not having that. Mm-hmm. You know, It was important to, to educate, and I was a wee bit younger than you, Kevin, but from the same kind of era... And you were learning not only about some of these social aspects that you've described there, but it was not the view that was informing me about the issues at the club, the boardroom issues, because if you read Pravda, which was probably you guys that named it Pravda, yeah. right? <laughs> everything was rosy in the garden, right? And we're going to build this fantastic stadium, everything was fine. But you guys were telling us the truth. Yeah. Now, when it came to fruition, when the club was on its knees and ready to go into receivership as it was back then, um, and then obviously it was pulled out of the, the mire at the last minute. Tell us a wee bit about that, and what did you see the, for, for the fanzine to be the future? Because obviously you've, you've set it up as a voice against the board, and the board have toppled. Did you ever think, job done, or was it, no, we can continue with this? There was discussions about that, you know, and uh, we did think, well, that's that, you know, it's everything going to be rosy. Bus parade in the Gallagate. Aye, I know, aye. <laughs> Who'd have thought we'd have done a treble treble later on, eh? Uh, and we thought, well, no, we shouldn't really let it go. Let's keep going because, I we're looking good. We're 
was kind of came out of that. We're, 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 no, we're no in the grave, you know. We were close, but we weren't in it. So everything's good. Did we just walk away or did we keep checking them? We thought, aye, we'll keep checking them. So we'll keep coming out. We'll keep going and doing things. And you need to remember in the days as well was, again, talk about social media and all that. We were getting stuff. And when we printed it, that's when you go to the news. It wasn't like, mm -hmm. like now you could get something and someday in Australia would, would get the same. I'd send you something, you send it to them and they'd go to it within seconds, you know. Uh, so when we actually put stuff out, it was there, the rumour mill mm. and all that stuff, you know. Uh, we really? loved that, man, you know. And see back then as well, a lot of the media gave us stuff because it wasn't the same kind of attitude of what it is like now, you know. It's, they were fishing for information, you know, about obviously going to the, the cameras lying and playing at, at the Hoover Stadium, whatever <laughs> they were going to call it out there. <laughs> and uh, so stuff, we knew right away, just been delving into a wee bit of things. And there were some people on sideways in the media. Now, we never, we never, we were never cosy with them. We were never cosy with anybody at Celtic Park either. They were just still, even the new regime, when they have us, they had us in for the presentation and kicked us back out to our seats. But, uh, and that's the way we like it anyway. But, um, there was the never, it should be. Aye, of course, it's the way it should be. And, uh, but there was, I just, we all thought, no, we'll keep going because you don't know what's around the corner. We still need to be there. Mm -hmm. We still need to bring up issues. And if people still buy it and it's still worth it, we'll keep it going. And that's that's why it's still going. So in 2019, treble, treble, um, everything would appear on the outside to be rosy. What are the issues now then, Joe, that you would cover and not the view? If you look at your your manifesto when you first started, we're going to tackle issues that the club are not doing right. What are the issues now that fans, do you think, should be concerned about? Uh, God, there's loads, aren't there? Uh, where do you start? Different with? type of issue it is, it's, entirely it's, now. It's totally it? different now. Yeah. Because, European Super Leagues. Aye. Well, uh, uh, again, we go back to modern football. Yeah, I just read something about how UV want to change the whole structure of the, the Champions League and stuff like that. And, and it was them that invented the Champions yeah, League. Yeah, I know. And, 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 and you're looking at, well, and that's a bigger picture. You're going, well, where are we going to be and all mm -hmm, that? Yeah. Are we put, is Celtic as a club and a board pushing ourselves as a voice to be heard? Are we, are we acting like minnows? Obviously the SFA and uh, with that lot across there, the zombies, you know, you're kind of thinking, are they still letting that go? Uh, we're still pushing on that yeah. as well. You know, all that stuff. I know there's other stuff that's going on in the background with that. Another thing is, is going just now that people don't like to talk about, and we don't actually put it in the fanzine, but... It is an issue is the ongoing uh, the Celtic Boys Club thing. You know, our name is getting dragged through the mud with that. And again, that's up to Celtic to be strong. We don't think Celtic's strong media-wise, modern technology-wise, in promoting or challenging things. So that's, and again, that's all stuff that's not even kicking the ball. Mm -hmm. So when you, there's still loads of issues out mm -hmm. with actually going to watch Celtic for 90 minutes and playing football. Obviously, the recruitment side it all, and, and, and is Lenny going to be the man, and how did the process go with that? Were they genuinely looking at other candidates? Were they genuinely going to push out the ball, and are they going to get the recruitment right to balance it all up so that we can get good players in? And So there's still loads of issues with Celtic, mm -hmm. and as I said, there's two things right away that are wee bit of football but loads of things off, loads, off the field loads of yeah. Things. Yeah. Yeah. and again you're justified in keeping the fans in going because some of these issues need to be discussed as you say they need to be highlighted because a lot of the time the club won't highlight it so the question needs to be asked mm. um, one thing that again I became obsessed with was the, the fan ultra movement and um, I thought it was an incredible uh, tale how Celtic and Sancta Pauli had this friendship I remember going to the games and hearing these a small group of guys chanting up when we came away for the game. And it was, what is that song? And then starting to explore a wee bit more. Could you tell us how a wee group of Celtic fans got immersed in the culture of uh, this wee harbour part of Hamburg? I mean, were they looking for the Reaper band? Tell the truth. <laughs> no, the no. They were the Beatles tour. No. <laughs> Aye. Uh, to be funny, uh, to, there's a, we had a few links with, with, with German boys um, Munich, Stuttgart, HSV, believe it or not, big Rudy, one of the, he was one of the top boys in the HSV back in the day, and mad, mad Celtic, you know, and uh, 
he took Jerry. He actually sees him Pauli uh, one time in Hamburg. Is and there was no friction between these clubs at the time. Mm-hmm. That's how the gap was so much. But uh, I can't remember what year it was. But we got a, a Stefan through the fan laden. Got in touch saying we're bringing kind of two bus loads over, going to Ireland, coming up, and then finishing off coming to Glasgow to see Celtic play Rangers at Celtic Park. Can you help us? So, like, okay, and I think some of the other fanzines got involved as well, but we, the, the, they really got in touch with us. We got everybody together, put them up in groups of threes and fours and all that, and then it kind of, we got them all tickets, believe it or not, and it wasn't if we went up to Celtic Park and goes, got this group coming there, got to get them tickets. It was like, see if you've got a spare ticket, he's one. And it was all yeah. that, you know, it was really begging that way because we had no contacts at Celtic Park, none. And uh, so all this squad came out of these mad German punk <laughs> squatters looking like punks for our early days and Jerry and I are going, this is brilliant, man. This is absolutely <laughs> brilliant. You know, and uh, we just got friendships. The, the guys that stayed with me, I had four guys staying with me in my flat in the south side at the time, and then I got really friendly with other guys, talking about music. Uh, one of my, my best mates now, Dirk, is lead singer with a band called Slime, uh, massive in Germany, and uh, me and him, I've been we talked to each other since then, you know, still. So they came over as a massive big group, and then friendships were formed. We went over to Hamburg for the first time, and we arranged a football match just beside the Millen Tour, and uh, I love the name Millen Tour because my name's in it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's home for me. And uh, there was no ultra groups then at the time, obviously with St Pauli, and uh, it was just the fan laden was the main focus for all the political stuff and football activism and all that. So we played them at football. They, they absolutely got us slaughtered the night before. We played them on the following day. They beat us. So we organised a return match and they came over to Glasgow and we actually played outside the Ibrox at the, the complex there. complex, yeah. And uh, that, uh, we, we turned them over because we got them pissed and then <laughs> beat them the following day. So, uh, and that's that was basically how it worked. You know, and there was we groups is all taught about music, politics, football, blah, blah, blah. And it all came through. And then that, I'm not saying we started the friendship with Celtic because... But that was a start of it. That was a big part of it. In fact, just down the road there, we had a night for them in uh, uh, what's the pub just underneath the arches. Uh, just behind the Brazen Head is the pub with the arches. Uh, Sharkies. Sharkies, that's the one. Aye. And uh, we had the Pete Diggers in playing and all that. We had a night for them. We had uh, even had pipes and everything, you know, and just had a great night for them. Uh, and then ever since that, we I've been going over to St Pauli. I had a season ticket for for many years at St Pauli as well. And um, basically, what I did was I bought a season ticket and I left it with my mates. I mean, anybody that can't afford and I'm not there, use it if they can give me whatever. I'll, if they can't give me, I'll have beer money when I come over. So I kept that going and and then watched how their fan base changed from the fan landing which still goes into this ultra movement and scene mm. and I just thought it was amazing loved it and then all the, it wasn't the us that brought it to Celtic Park obviously all the young squad uh, who was it before the, the Jungle Boys, Jungle and, Boys. All and, yeah. and all that and groups started forming and then the Green Brigade got it and just not saying copied but it took their slant on it and, yeah. and changed it on and I just think it's brilliant in modern. The only so thing, good thing in modern football, yeah. really, is the fan culture like that. Britain and the establishment and the, the authorities just can't get their head around it. Just can't handle it. They 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 immediately labelled them as hooligans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as yep. as as the ones that are right. causing the trouble. You know, mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. But I, I just love what they bring to a game. You know, because it was so stagnant and and mm-hmm. the crowds at, at times you were going. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's great to see youngsters engaged. In the same way that we were engaged in, in the jungle, when yeah, when we, and when it we, does go back we to what we were saying about you said about being learning stuff on the sporters bus. You know, mm-hmm. you, know, you I would question songs about oh, what's that song about? You know, and something I never heard before, and you'd ask about it. And then I love the way like the Green Brigade as well. You see flags and stuff, and and 
people now we we where we sit at Celtic Park, we with kids, our kids and all that are all growing up and coming in beside us now. And you see them like no, and you go, well, that's such and such. They're doing that for that reason, or that's yeah. because of. And as I said, it is an education mm-hmm. going to this. You know, you've got sixty thousand people at a football mm-hmm. stadium. Mm-hmm. You are going to get something. You know, it's going to politics wise, where it's Celtic, or you, know, you look at the other side to other teams. You know, or getting a lot of right wing hearts have got a wee bit of problem now with rock talking about that Yaxi Lennon mm. guy, uh-huh. you know, uh, turning up at hearts and trying to get a wee bit of publicity there and and you look at Rangers with now, since I was a boy they had BNP and all that getting sold outside their grounds and all that. So that culture of of all that is there for other clubs as well. So you see that in ultras and I think it's a good thing because as I say it's an education for a lot of people to turn around and say why they're doing that and what they're doing it for. But I also get the flip side of guys who say, I, I don't want that in my, in my game. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I want to see Celtic and that's what I'm here to see. Yeah. I get that. I totally understand it. But they need to understand that's never happened since Celtic started. No. Mm-hmm. He tried to tell me Celtic played that first game of football, the Irish, and well, it probably would have been all Irish at the game, maybe a few Scots, but you're talking about our forefathers. They weren't talking about home rule and mm-hmm. the situation in Ireland or the situation here in Scotland. Of course they bloody were. Mm-hmm. You know? But I get it if they don't want to be interested in I, it. I love the, the creativity and the, the artists that the, the Green Brigade bring. Yeah. And all the groups, when you look all over Europe on a weekly basis and social media yeah. makes it quite easy for you to see stuff now. Yeah. If you look at some of the banners and you go, wow, yeah. that put the amount of planning. And it's not just... I'm spraying on a bed sheet here. Yeah. You look at some of them in, in Italy and they've got political connotations. They represent their city, they represent their stuff in the banners, the amount of detail you're talking about. It's like uh, four or five weeks of work uh, go, goes into this and you're like, that's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. banners st- banners on bed sheets still what we done, do the honourable thing, resign to right across, in the middle of the jungle at the end of my Celtic games to the Celtic board mm-hmm. and we put it up and there was guys in the jungle like, absolutely lifting us up and fro- forcing us and t- ended up with two cafes and guys were trying to go in the park with it so that was our <laughs> wee TIFO back then you know? and I'd done that in a bed sheet I did but the cup final one um, I thought it was amazing everybody done it nobody moaned about it nah. I watched people coming in and putting their bibs on Aye. and I just thought that's so different from maybe five years ago even the, the, our five, eight years ago. When you they watch- just came in, done it, and I never seen what the actual TIFO was because I was in it. Mm-hmm. You know, I could, and the angle I was at, I couldn't see actually what it was in. After the game, we were walking back to the car, my nephew was showing me pictures that were all on social media, which you love now because you get it like that. And uh, I just thought it was amazing how it changed for mm-hmm. into the, the numbers as well mm-hmm. and all that. And this, I, I think as well when you watch that game back on the TV, the Celtic ends green and white. That, that, that is there. The constant. Whole time, the whole time. Aye. It kind of disappears halfway during the second half, right enough. And all the folk took, started Aye. taking them off as started perspiring as when Hearts went one nothing up. But, but it still kind, looks... Aye, it looked amazing because it was all the way around and people just did it. It was like when the Green Brigade done their own tricolour one Aye. for the whole game and every time the ball went up you just see <laughs> try it and then you're just like, that's genius, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of... I think I kind of see that in a kind of fanzine when we done the red card kind of thing, you Definitely. know. It's a, a modern day equivalent Aye. of doing something that's gonna catch the eye and the imagination of everybody. So there's there's kind of links there. How, everybody how, showed how, fracture uh, the red card uh, that day. Yeah, uh, no, you're right. I mean, Kevin, you mentioned earlier that uh, authority doesn't like people to be organised, and that's why the Green Brigade are lambasted by. Um, authority because they're organised right and because if you can organise even just a TIFO but a demonstration they didn't want that now when we think about us going over to St Pauli playing twice I believe once for their centenary when Paddy McCourt scored Mm -hmm. a typically mazy goal uh, we've never had them over here at Celtic Park Strange that, isn't it? It is. Why, why wouldn't the club embrace that that friendship that's been built up via the fans? Uh, I mean, if you brought them over for a friendly, can you imagine the carnival atmosphere? We, we, I have actually mentioned it before in in the, the corridors of Celtic Park. And I always, forever, I've always wondered why we're playing certain teams pre-season. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it just must be a money thing with them. They're not interested in, for us as fans, who to actually see 
coming to Celtic Park to play against, and you just think, well, that's a that's a surefire winner. I know. In fact, you see any German team out with HSV and uh, a few others, you know, uh, Hansa Rostock, for example, who is a big enemy of St Pauli. Um, you just think a lot of German clubs, you know, Dortmund, mm-hmm. Munich. All these guys would bring. They'd be more attractive for us as fans and for the players to probably play a pre-season. Well, St. Pauli, exactly. They, they, bring, they bring over about ten thousand. Well, you've got the season book freebie, which mm. uh, yeah. we've went playing as this game as a freebie because nobody will go to it anyway. Uh, this year, is it Rens? Is uh, it the, always poorly attended. Uh, so it? these games yeah. are always poorly attended. As yeah. you say, if you brought across a Dortmund, a St. Pauli. Even a fire nord, you, you you would add thousands on yeah, the attendance, and there'll be an interest yeah. in the game. And again, you go back back to what we're saying about education at football and, and learning stuff. You bring St. Pauli over here, young kids will be going, "Why are we playing them? Yep. What's this all about?" Right. You then you say these guys are anti-racism, anti-homophobic, women's rights at football, all the stuff. You can just turn around to your. Your, your nieces and nephews and tell them all about that mm-hmm. and that sinks into their head oh, now we remember stuff when we were kids going to games Definitely, they'll yeah. be doing the same you yeah. know and that that would be a wonderful thing you know talk about education the Green Brigade the Palestinian fundraising efforts to the point where Roger Waters has got it in a backdrop when he's yeah. playing live Joe tell us about your thoughts on that as a final point on the fact that these people are influential in a good way I, I I, I supported it. I know a lot of people didn't. I did, 100%. Um, I actually went to the away match after that. And uh, we were lucky enough to go down to uh, uh, one of the camps. I'll tell, I'll tell you what really happened. We, we arrived in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, sorry, Tel Aviv. We were a wee bit wary about it. And uh, we got into our digs and we're signing in. And this guy's like looking at us and he's going, Are you Celtic? And I'm like, yeah. Because, yeah, I seen what you did against uh, the Shiva last week. Said, oh, fuck, here we go. And he went, that was good. And I went, yeah, yeah, thanks. And uh, just kind of played it like that. And I started talking to the guy who worked on it. And uh, he's Israeli, Jewish guy, you know. And I've been there before, seen Celtic play Tel Aviv, and but obviously not under the circumstances of what happened at the home game. And uh, the guy was talking away to us, and he's going, yeah, yeah, and... It's good to highlight it and all the our government shit and all that and and then right away I just thought he's exactly saying what I say about our government here. They don't represent me. They, mm-hmm. they that's not me as a UK because we're under British government. I was like the Tories don't represent me, and he was saying this. I said these guys don't represent me. There has to be a solution. And the guy was absolutely and that was just checking into the hotel. So the guy was brilliant and all that. So it made us at ease and. Um, we had a night there, and then we, we drove, we hired a car, drove up to the West Bank, we couldn't get in there, and then we just drove down to Beersheba. And that, that was a bit scary, because there was a lot of, a lot of their fans were really up 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 against us, you know, and um, never, not so much before the game, going to it, we were all right going in, because they were all in early, typical as we all had a beer, and <laughs> stole in, just before kick-off, but after the match, load. There was buses laid on that went back to Tel Aviv, but uh, four of us came out. We were going back to the town centre, and um, the police wouldn't let us out. Uh, they says, "No, you're not walking. Blah blah blah. We'll get you a taxi. It's not safe." So they put us on a taxi, drove round the corner, and the taxi got attacked with Fashiva fans and all that, shouting, "Come out, you Palestinian lovers!" and kicking them out and that. I was like, "The taxi, I put your foot down, mate. Come on!" and they were trying to get us, you know, big time, and we got back into the town, and thought, oh, jeez, lucky escape there, and it turned out the, the hotel we were in, the team came in, Celtic came in, right. we were sitting at the bar, and every one of them just went straight up to the room, bar back near b they came out and spoke to us, because he was meeting family beside it, and we are taught away him and that, and uh, I didn't mention anything about Oh, right. and stuff, you know, it's, he's, a, he's a football player and he does what he does, but I just thought that was a nice, he came out and sp- right, spoke to nice us, man. Bruni and all the rest of them just went right by us, you know, and I was a bit, you know, just, you just feel they should have done something, but anyway, yeah. the following day, uh, we drove along, into, up into the camps at, uh, in Bethlehem, 
and up that area and down near uh, Jerusalem and that was that was something else, you know, seeing the seeing the wall that separates these people, you know, and our guide was talking to us and he's and uh, he said to us uh, we we hired this guy and the guide took us around and he's saying all my neighbourhood watched the game last night and he says you could hear TVs from everywhere and he says what, what we thought you were going to lose and we so wanted you to win we've seen what you did at Celtic Park and this guy was talking about it, it made us feel we're not abandoned mm -hmm. and see as soon as he said that I just thought everything the Green Brigade done at that game was worth it for him just saying Aye. we know we're not abandoned now Celtic is our team because of that and I know it's not because of the actual play and stuff and all that but I just knew for that he says it gave them something in their heart. It gave them a wee bit of hope that the world isn't he ignoring them and isn't he just thinking they're left behind. And I, I, that was amazing, this guy telling us that. Absolutely That's amazing. Powerful, eh? I've got goosebumps. He's in the neighbourhood. He says, the neighbourhood. Mm -hmm. He says it was quiet. You could hear TVs and it was all the match. That's how much interest it took in it because of that first game. I was, it was I, I, you're saying it I, yeah, I can yeah, feel yeah, it yeah. Astonishing. honestly I can feel it going through my legs and up through me the way that guy's it. and I, I've still got the guy's number because I said I'm going to go back and I'm going to meet him and try and get, get to see him a lot of people say we shouldn't have been there either uh, for the game I get that as well which, uh, a guy saying Joe why are you going out there I can't believe you're going out in that country and all that and I says well I'll tell you why I'm going out I want to see what it's like yeah. mm -hmm. I want to experience it for the people who live there, I says, because I don't know. And I says, I'm glad I did, because my eyes were opened, seeing that bloody wall which separates them. You've got and, to see and listen, don't and you? And what you go through to get from the Tel Aviv into Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. Honestly, you'd... You know, Trump talks about walls and all the rest of it. Anybody talking about walls separating people, try and see that place. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's frightening. Joe, that, that really encapsulates the power of Celtic Football Club and the fans, the, the Celtic fans. So thanks very much for sharing that and thanks for being on A Celtic State of Mind. No that problem, problem. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. A Celtic State of Mind can be found at axom.net. We're sponsored by Fansbet, the betting company by fans for fans. Good to go, mate. When the green lights go on, we can get a going. Oh. 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 Can we keep that in? I'm, I've recorded it, so I... It's <laughs> <laughs> going on. <laughs>